This is part nine in a series of videos in which I'm developing this. It is a magnetic core memory system and it consists of two main parts. We've got the core array itself and then we have the uh, logic control and driver electronics. And uh, I was aiming for a 64 byte array so uh, there are 512 cores. It's an 8 bit byte I'm using. And um, an interesting question came up in response to the previous video that I posted about whether the system could be expanded and made bigger, adding more cores. And what I thought I'd do before proceeding through the rest of the uh, design and showing you the system in action, uh, there are a few steps left in design yet, but um, in response to the question I thought I'd just address it and uh, kind of underline really why I'm going about this project in the first place. So the, as I said the question was whether the system could be scaled up and more cores added and there are two basic ways to go about expanding a memory core system. Uh, one is to simply add more cores to the array and the other one of course is just to add multiple uh, blocks of uh, similar memory. So in other words you could either make the array bigger or you could just use multiple versions of this stacked up and uh, have a suitable decoder to address them. Now another question I had was uh, relating to the number of drivers and sense circuits required as the memory system got bigger and um, you get increasing return as you make the arrays bigger so for example if you start with a 4x4 um, array you'll need 8 driver circuits, if you go to 8x8 you need 16, if you go to 16x16 16 16, you need 32 driver circuits but of course you get a hugely more uh, increase in the number of cores uh, relative to the number of drivers that you're uh, adding. So um, once you get beyond a certain point then it becomes very uh, effective to add more cores but it's not quite as simple as it may seem and this is really what this video is about. Um, the answer to the question can you make this bigger? Uh, you can but it does entail a lot of complication which I hope to demonstrate uh, over the next few minutes. So the reason I went for uh, 64 bytes, I could have gone for you know, 2 bytes, um, but the reason I decided to make a fairly large array is because uh, I really wanted to try and get across the difficulty um, back when core memory was being developed of scaling them up. It's not quite as straightforward as it may first seem. So in the earlier videos I showed um, a, an arrangement like this uh, hooked up to some drive electronics or even just to a power supply and this is just a single core with a number of wires passing through it so this is the four wire arrangements where we've got the X, the Y, the inhibit and the sense wires but it's a single core and really each core with the wires passing through you can think of as a transformer with each of the wires being one of the windings on the transformer albeit a single turn but they do act like transformers so if you put an impulse onto the XY for example you'll get a, uh, a current induced in the sense inhibit and the Y wires so they all interact to a certain extent and the signals I've been showing in response to doing the demonstrations to try and keep it as uh, simple and clear as possible were using just a single core. Now the problem is of course that the cores are actually arranged in these mats so it's an 8x8 array and the X wire if we start with the X0 wire it runs from the top of this connector runs all the way along, comes down, runs all the way back and terminates on the top of this bottom connector, actually it terminates on the bottom of the bottom connector. Um, but the point is that wire, a single wire goes through um, 64 cores and the same is true of the Y wires, they go through 64 cores as well and the sense wire goes through 64 cores uh, all on the same mat. So every single wire actually goes through 64 cores and if we take 
the simple example of our single core that we've been looking at and look at it in the context of the array. What we end up with is something like this. So this is how it's actually uh, wired in. So each of these vertical lines is a core. So we have the X wire goes through, and this is a single mat by the way, the X wire goes through eight cores and the Y wire also goes through eight cores but one of those cores is common to X and Y so if you imagine that uh, eight uh, X cores go across and eight Y cores go down but the top left hand one is the uh, the common one and that's the one we're trying to switch and that's the only one I've been showing in the demonstrations so far but the sense wire that we're picking the signal up on goes through all eight of the uh, cores that the XY goes through, uh, all eight of the cores that the YY goes through, and then it goes through 48 other cores, each of which has an X or a Y wire passing through it. And all of these are effectively transformers, so they all interact. So for example, when we put uh, a current on the X wire, uh, not only do we induce um, a current in the sense wire from the core we're trying to switch but we also induce a current into the sense wire from all the other cores that are common to that particular X wire and the same with the Y wire that um, every core that is common to the Y wire and that sense wire when we energize the Y wire will also induce a current into the sense wire and of course the uh, other cores that are in the circuit will have some influence to either damp the uh, sense signal or uh, create ringing or noise or something. So although with a single core or even two or three cores it's very straightforward you get a nice clear output on the sense line very straightforward um, and you can throw something together very quickly but when you start getting beyond four, five or six cores in each dimension of your array and especially by the time you get to eight or more then things get very much more complex and in fact if you look at the circuitry for the original core memory systems they were very complex and usually used transformers to couple signals to the core and uh, all manner of um, uh, methods to cut down noise and interaction. Um, so this is the arrangement we have in our system and whereas we had very strong signals in the previous demonstration um, what I've got set up now is what I've just shown on the diagram so the cores we now have on this rear breadboard the core on the right is our common core so that is this core and then we have seven other cores which are these cores that's followed by uh, seven other cores threaded on the sense and the Y wire and then we have 48 more cores that are only on the uh, sense inhibit wire. Now it's not a true reflection of course because we don't have the other X and Y wires going through but in theory when we energize this X wire and this Y wire the other wires should be inactive. They will have some impact but the way I've designed the circuitry is those wires should be effectively floating uh, other than the small damping capacitance on there so um, we shouldn't get too much of an impact from them and that is an important part of the design of a system like this you need to take into account when you're designing the circuits what's going to happen when you hook up uh, the entire array so what we'll do now is uh, power this up so what I've got set up here by the way is um, the same or very similar um, pulse sequence generator that we have on the board that I've shown and two of the uh, wire driver circuits. These aren't quite the same as what's on the board but they're fairly similar and give a similar result. It's very difficult to do this on a breadboard system with all these wires um, flying around the place because we're talking here about very fast signals um, you know, in the order of 20 or 30 nanosecond rise time for quite high currents so having all these wires flying around doesn't help and also breadboards are uh, very difficult to do this sort of thing on but hopefully you'll get the idea from what we see on the scope.
Okay, so I'll power this on and now I'll start the uh, sequence generator. So what we can see now is this initial spike, the big spike on the left, this is the direct coupled signal and the reason it's so big is because um, we're effectively getting coupling between all of these cores and all of these cores because we're switching the X and the Y wire at the same time and that direct coupled signal is this first huge spike that we're seeing the scope's currently set to 200 millivolts per division so that's about 800 millivolts uh, spike that's not the signal we're interested in that's the one we've got to kind of work around um, the one we're interested in is the signal that's created in the sense wire when this core switches magnetization state and as you can see it's um, very much smaller than the direct coupled signal so i'll now turn up the scope so we can have a closer look and we're now at 50 millivolts per division and the signal we're interested in uh, is actually this one just to the right of the hump and there's a few things we've got to be careful of again with the design um, the amount of current we pass through the core is important and if we put too much current through just the XY for example then we will actually switch every single core and that's not what we want to do otherwise we'd effectively overwrite data in these when we try to write data to just this core and the same with the Y core. So we need the current to be low enough to only switch when both wires are energized but high enough to make sure that we switch reliably and get a big enough signal. So the signal, um, although the uh, switching of the core occurs at a certain threshold, the signal will continue to get bigger the higher the current. So the higher that we can set the current uh, without switching the cores we don't want to, the better. And that's part of the design setup is to optimize that level. This is actually quite a good signal output. We're getting uh, almost 100 millivolts, although some of that is sitting on the kind of tail end of this initial spike. So our measurable signal is actually about 40 millivolts. And I can demonstrate this by disconnecting uh, the X wire. So with just one Y energized, you can see the spike on the left is still there because we're still getting coupling between the Y wires and the sense wire. Um, but we're not now getting the switching um, signal. So I put the XY back in and again we can see we're getting this secondary hump. And just to prove this further, this is the core switching. If I reduce the current um, that's been fed through the uh, cores or through the wires, notice that that secondary hump disappears so we're not getting switching of the core. Uh, what I'm aiming for here is to get the biggest differential between um, or the biggest scope if you like our, our operational window for the uh, current and the component values. If I was making just one it wouldn't matter I'll just set it up so it works but because I'm hoping to sell these uh, boards to somebody else that might want to build them I have to select values that are uh, fairly generous in terms of the operational window. Having said that, if you intend to build one of these then you may well have to tinker with it to get it working properly. Okay, so I'll increase the current very slightly and we'll find we'll get to a certain threshold and it will suddenly start uh, showing us a signal. So that's now already started, although you can't see much and you can see it's kind of intermittent in nature. Um, we're now at the kind of lower threshold of the switching. Incidentally, these spikes over here are the um, core switching back the other way. The reason I need two drivers is because I effectively have to read the core to erase it, otherwise it would uh, get one spike and then stop. So the sequence generator and drivers are writing a one to the core and then reading it back to erase it again. Okay, we'll increase the current a bit further. And notice now we're getting quite a decent sized uh, signal but it's not so big that it's causing all the cores to switch you'll see very quickly if all the cores start switching you'll get a huge um, response 
uh, where we're looking at our signal. It looked very good, but um, it won't work because you'll be erasing all the data in the array each time you try and write a single bit. I can also demonstrate is that particular core that's switching. I've got a magnetic screwdriver here, and if I bring that to uh, any of the cores, you'll see they move and they've been attracted to the screwdriver. You'll get some distortion, of course, but uh, nothing much until we get to the core at the end, which is our uh, target core, and then you'll see that the signal completely disappears. But it's the only core that you can do that with. If you bring it up to the other cores, it doesn't do that because they're not involved other than uh, causing a problem for us. Uh, but only the core at the end is the one that's generating this signal. Okay, so as I said, um, we can adjust this over a, a fairly wide range. I'm in the process of optimizing this. It is different on the actual board from the breadboards. The breadboards behave slightly differently, so the component values are different, uh, but the circuit operates in an identical manner. We just get slightly better performance on the board itself. Uh, okay, so I hope that made sense. Um, what I'm trying to get across here is that this is very much a system design. You need to uh, take into account what you're going to have in the array, not just a single core. And you need to design the electronics to operate in what is quite a small window um, of acceptance. The, uh, as I say, if you get the currents too high, then you'll end up switching the cores you don't want to. If you get the current too low, it won't reliably switch and uh, you won't be able to again select the cores that you want and on top of that I obviously want to keep the circuit as simple as possible I don't want to start having um, to source uh, coupling transformers and that sort of thing um, but having said that I wanted the core uh, the array to be big enough so that it really starts to show just how clever the guys back then were to design systems that had hundreds of cores um, in each direction so they really did get very big and the task of trying to pick the rapidly diminishing sense signal out of the background noise and uh, spikes and external interference was um, very impressive that the core memory system work as reliably as they do. Okay, well hopefully that's given some insight into the obstacles and hurdles that have to be overcome when designing one of these systems. As I said, uh, I thought I'd include this video just to uh, really underline um, the, the problems that uh, you have to overcome when you design a core memory system that has more than just a few cores in it. And um, what we'll do in the next few videos is uh, complete the assembly of the main board and see how it works, maybe couple it to a microprocessor. But if you have any questions, then please leave a comment.